All right. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Sarah Batman. I am an officer of Chiefs of Science and Engineering, and I'm also an Anselm House Fellow. Um, Anselm House is a community of UNM students, faculty, and people living around the Twin Cities. Um, our mission is connecting faith and knowledge with all of life. So we really focus on how our faith can be integrated with our relationship with people, um, our studies, and our work. Um, so I'm a part of a year-long program, part of Anselm House, that um, focuses on how my life as a student connects with God's story. And it's been a really awesome experience. Um, we get free meals, which is awesome every other Monday. Uh, good perk. Um, so we will be passing around clipboards. If you're interested in Anthem House Wall or more, um, you can get our email. Um, it's, it's not, we're not going to spam you. It's, it's a good email. Um, so you can sign up if you're interested. Um, I would also like to thank our co-sponsors for this event. Um, Ties and crew and Stan Village Church. This event is another example of uh, Anselm House. Um, what we really want to follow is through Anselm House. We connect it. We're looking at how um, work in the university connects with Christian faith. Um, so now uh, Professor David Odie will be introducing our speaker for the day. Um, why don't you give him a round of applause? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great honor to introduce Chris Macosco today. Uh, first of all, I just want to kind of give uh, the academic perspective. I mean, when you do an introduction for an academic, you talk about their background and their accomplishments and things like that. And, and Chris has the kind of accomplishments you could really, like you just dream that you might have as an academic. They're uh, really out of this world. Uh, He's a world leader in rheology, which is the study of how uh, materials flow into form. Uh, all his degrees are in chemical engineering. He got his bachelor's from Carnegie Mellon, his master's from Imperial University in Imperial College in London, and his PhD from Princeton University. And from there, uh, he worked two years in industry, uh, was recruited by Neil Amundsen, uh, namesake for this building that we're in right now, Amundsen Hall, to come here to, uh, to be on the faculty of chemical engineering in 1970. So he's been here over 47 years now. And just a few of the things that he's done in that time, uh, he's published at, at well over 400 papers, and maybe it's a lot more than that, but um, over 400 papers. He's mentored over 100 PhD students uh, in that time. He's directed I-Prime, the uh, Industrial Partnership for Research in Interfacial and Materials Engineering, <coughs> the major center at Industry Consortium. Um, has made Minnesota a really world leader in uh, materials. He's the recipient of the Charles Stein Award in Materials Engineering and Science from ASEHE. He's the recipient of the Bingham Medal uh, from the Society for Rheology. He's a fellow of the American Physical Society, and he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, that's quite a CV. <laughs> and in addition, He's, he's taught at this university the following courses, rheology, colloid science, polymer chemistry, polymer properties, polymer processing, polymerization, reactor engineering. I think he likes polymers. <laughs> <laughs> Process and product design, chemical engineering, unit operations, fluid mechanics, and mass and energy balances. And I know like even just recently he's been teaching the sophomores mass and energy balances. So the complete deal, the teaching, the research, and everything. And I thought as part of my intro that I would talk about my own story with Chris because actually I've known Chris for a long time, uh, probably longer than many or even most of his uh, chemical engineering colleagues. <laughs> because it goes back to 1984 
which was definitely a different time, but it was not a different place. It's actually, we met here when I was a student. I uh, came here in 1984 to study chemical engineering. That's kind of what I looked like then. We can only have brainy pictures from back then. Uh, and I came here to study chemical engineering because I thought if I stayed in, if I was in chemistry and math, I'd have to go to graduate school. I certainly didn't want to do that. I just wanted to go work in industry. Um, along the way, I got interested in research, and I ended up going to graduate school. <laughs> and that's been the path that I've been, I've been on since then. Two things that were really important for me. One was I took a, pro a programming course, and I had this feeling that computers were going to be big. And so I kind of invested in that. And uh, even today, now in biomedical engineering, I direct a center that's focused on simulating, for example, uh, cell migration and cancer. But the other thing that happened that was big uh, for me was I was assigned an advisor in chemical engineering. And that person was Chris McCosco. Um, so I was able to be guided through my studies here uh, with Chris. and. Uh, that was just kind of a so-called uh, random assignment, I guess, that he was my advisor. And uh, over the course of time, I, I went on to complete PhD myself. And uh, after initial faculty appointment at Michigan Tech, came back here to Minnesota in 1999 to be uh, uh, a colleague of Chris's. Now I was, I was the first external hire into this new uh, biomedical engineering department here at the University of Minnesota. And so we became uh, colleagues together on the faculty. But about 10 years ago, I went through a very difficult period in my life. And I got to a point where uh, it, I felt like I couldn't really continue on if I, if there was no other way for me to continue on except through accepting and surrendering my life to Jesus Christ as my Savior. And this transformed my life since then. And part of that transformation was, uh, has involved Chris because a, a little, over three years ago, he invited me to join him and others in a uh, Bible reading group called Lectio Divina. And some of the other members are here today, too. And this has just been a, a great time of, of weekly reading and applying uh, Bible verses that we read together. And I guess I, I felt comfortable with that because he was a long trusted advisor. Um, and along the way, then, I started to gain uh, a friend uh, as someone who not only was an advisor, but a spiritual advisor as well, <clears throat> and a friend. And he wasn't a friend of just uh, me. He was a friend of many other people. I want to show uh, Kennedy Nyangola, who is a Fulbright Fellow, and he sent a message, too, for this meeting, uh, for this lecture. He said, uh, the good memories I and my wife Abigail have of our stay at the University of Minnesota as a Fulbright Scholar which is just a couple years ago, shall always remain indelible in our hearts. We will never forget the warm hospitality you and your very loving wife, Pastor Kathleen, showed us, most especially during our worship at Stadium Village Church. And I think there are many such stories, and I, I can't recount all of them, but I just want to make it obvious that there are so many people who connect uh, to Chris uh, in so many ways. And I realized myself, I became a friend really hit me when I was out on the lake. This is at Chris's cabin, and Chris was on one jet ski and I was on another. And we're just racing at like 40 miles an hour across the lake. And I'm thinking, this is kind of weird to be racing my undergraduate advisor on jet skis. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you think, well, he was my advisor when I was a student, right? And I, he's no longer officially my advisor because I graduated. No, it's not true. I looked it up this morning. If you go on to my, I logged into my U. <laughs> I clicked on not my advisees, but academics. My program is chemical engineering. <laughs> I I, my advisor is Chris McCosco. <laughs> 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 right now. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris McCosco for his final Great. Thank you so Thank much, you. buddy. Yeah, Boy, you never lose your advisor. No. That, I didn't know that. That was amazing. Always. What a great introduction and what a great group we have on Tuesday mornings. Well, this is a little bit scary. Not, you know, I lecture to uh, chemical engineers in this room for many years, and uh, it's great to see so many friendly faces. Uh, 
So that's, let me, yeah, we're, where you got to go. Let me get back to that. But I thought I'd, oh, let's see if we get that going. Is that, oh, there it goes. Great. Yeah, I'm going to knock the lights down a little bit, okay? And the, the, the volume level can go up just a touch more. Okay. Is that, how are we doing? It's, In the back, still a little more? I can hear it a little bit weak. All right, let's pull it up a little more. Anything? Yeah, we're pretty much up to the max. Okay. Keep, all right, I'll keep trying to talk loud and also try to get the lights, uh, yeah, there we go, down a little bit lower. Good? All right, great. I've been thinking that, you know, this time of year, the students especially are thinking about their futures, right? I see some nods here, jobs. I know some faces there. Am I going to, what, am I going to industry? Am I going to go to grad school? And, you know, just this week, we had, let's see, that should be on, let me try. Oh, that's good, okay, yeah. Oh, this is out, sorry. Let's get this going here. The, uh, the job fair on Monday, down, even downtown, there were so many people there. So we're thinking, finding jobs, and sometimes job is associated with the word vocation. What does vocation really mean? It comes from the, the Latin vocari, which means to call, right? To call. So a job is a vocation only if someone else is calling you to do something for them rather than yourself, right? So your work can be called a vocation or a calling if it's reimagined as a mission of service to something beyond merely your own instincts. If you think of work merely as some kind of self-fulfillment or self-realization, I think it slowly crushes a person, and it's not good for society either. That's where I was when I graduated. I was looking for self-fulfillment, and I I just, that was when I graduated from college and even my PhD. So I'd like to just take you on a little route through that time, okay? And it started because I loved chemistry. So that's me in front of an analytical balance that I rebuilt. And my dad took a picture. And... There I am weighing out uh, potassium nitrate and sulfur to make rocket fuel. And Eric and I made a rocket for the science fair, and we won a prize. It had a parachute that could uh, go off. And there's my buddies, and we're going to launch it right there. And uh, we needed an ignition system, so we used a car. Right there. Whoa, there it goes. That was so exciting. You know, in junior high, the, the, uh, the words chemistry used to pop out of the page, you know? And I got really interested in math. I, could, I was good at math and even calculating the impulse. I started, I, we never had calculus, but I tried to learn myself, you know, just to the, uh, the energy. So, you know, chemistry plus math equals chemical engineering, and that job should be worth, you know, be worth something, right? So I um, graduated, I, I went to Carnegie Mellon, as, as Dave said, and, and I graduated, and uh, I got my master's degree and graduated from Imperial College, and then I married the, a hometown girl from Berea, Ohio. There she is. Despite the fact that when she was in junior high, I tried to help her with her science fair project and it burned up in the basement, okay? <laughs> but she forgave me and her parents forgave me and they said, okay. So we went off to Princeton for graduate studies. So 
you know, you're thinking, what to some of you are going to grad school, and you're thinking, what topic should I work on? And about that time, a movie came out. Some of you may know this film. Let's see if the sound comes up. But this young man named, you know, he's an actor, but Dustin Hoffman, his mother is throwing a party for him at graduation. And these are her friends, and they're all asking him, what are you going to do when you graduate, right? What are you going to do? Let's see. I think we should keep here. You're lying. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Ben. Sorry about this. Mr. McGuire. Come on, give a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, Joanna. Okay. Yes. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, sir. Plastics. <laughs> so tell me how you want. It's a great future in plastics. Think about it. What do you think about it? Yes, sir. I'm sad. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, I really, this was great, this guy, you know, he was a cross-country runner, and that was, that was what I decided to work in, a polymer science. So polymer uh, material science was, was my area, and uh, we've actually had uh, Marcel Doy visiting today, and he knows a lot about entanglements. He was here. Uh, and so I am particularly interested in the flow. How do polymers flow? Uh, and we developed an instrument, test flow, with my best friend in grad school, uh, Joe Starita. And he had actually been a mechanical engineer, so it was really helpful that we could build this instrument. Here's a picture of it, and me uh, without safety glasses testing it. Um, <laughs> and it was very exciting. Uh, and we had developed a new transducer, which we patented. And people were interested. They said, this, this data is very good. You, know, it's, you can do things that weren't around at all at that time, linear viscoelasticity. And so we started a company while we were just at the end of our graduate school. But you know, we didn't really have any sales. And so we, there wasn't the days of venture capital. So we went on to each of us took jobs. So I was interviewing. It was quite a, a, a good economic time I had about eight job offers with industry. And the only place I thought there wasn't much polymer science going on in universities at that time. Uh, Florey had not even gotten a Nobel Prize in the area at that point and complained about how there wasn't polymer activity. So I um, was very happy considering you know, going to industry. And then a fellow came in my office named Neil Amundsen. He was on the um, visiting committee at Princeton. And he said, you know, we, this year, we're joining, the, the metallurgy department is joining with chemical engineering to form chemical engineering and material science. And we really need somebody with maybe a chemical engineering background uh, to in polymer materials. And he said, hey, come on out. I said, well, I'm not interested. He said, come on out and interview. And I did. Came to Amundsen Hall. It used to look like that. And now you recognize it here. And I could see that I could work on what I wanted to work on. I wanted to do research. I loved research. And I just love learning about polymers. But at each company, of course, they want you to work on whatever they're doing. You know, it's nice. Uh, but I said, wait, why not try it? If it doesn't work, I can go back and take one of those industrial jobs, you know? So I said, OK, I'll go. And I got uh, started up a lab here. One of my first graduate students, Bill Davis, built more interesting equipment. And I had $12,000 to start up my lab. And my salary was a little less than that, OK? Um, but uh, it was very exciting. I really enjoyed research. And I had very good students at the beginning. But you know, when you're a professor, you also have to teach. And uh, that took a lot of time. You know, those undergrads, they took a lot of time <laughs> preparing the lectures, you know. And, and even the grad students, you know, you got to work harder. you got to get data. Your data machine's getting data for me, you know, for me, okay, to uh, publish the papers. 
So it was a lot of long nights. I even grew a beard for a while to uh, look more authoritative, you know, um, a little bit older. But it was difficult because the company, I was still flying back to New Jersey where this company was. Joe's dad was in a machine shop and uh, he had uh, you know, put this Rheometrics company together. This was the first instrument uh, that was commercial. And uh, I had to fly back to demonstrate it. And I said, you know, Joe, you ought to, Joe said, I'd like to have more than 50% of the company. We were 50-50. He said, my dad's doing the construction and you know, it would be fair. I said, Joe, if you quit your job at General Electric, then, then that would be fair. You could have more than 50%. So we're arguing there for about a year. Meanwhile, we're trying to, you know, selling a few of the instruments. And, and finally, he called me one day and he said, Chris, I started polymetrics. Hmm, that's interesting. It was a crushing because he had half the patent. He had the patent. He could practice the patent. He controlled the manufacturing with his dad. You know, what are you going to do? This guy was my best friend, and I just, I got to get back at this. I got to figure out what's going on here. You know, try to some revenge or stop him to doing that. So it's just absolutely devastated. I can still feel it in my stomach. You know, how horrible. I don't know if you've had some kind of experience, you know, of that. And uh, very emotional as well as, um, you know, uh, my, so meanwhile, my wife, who had been trying to manage the family now with two kids, she started to go to a Bible study and said, um, you know, was talking to me about it. I said, oh, I don't know if this is that interesting. But she knew my problem. And she said, Chris, I think I have a verse for you. We've been studying uh, Paul's letters in the book of Romans. Well, this was Joe uh, again. And she said, do not take revenge, my dear friends. She told me to read this. But leave room for God's wrath, for it's written, mine is to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. It's very interesting. I read that, and that night, I'm not really used to praying, but I prayed. And I said, God, what should I do here? And I just felt that I should just give this up. Just give the whole thing up. And I got on a plane and I flew to, Joe was at GE in Massachusetts, and I signed over the patent and the stock in the company, and I wished him well. And I came back to Minnesota and I said, does God really communicate with people? And I um, started to go to a Bible study. But I also talked, it was very important, as, as Dave mentioned, I talked to a, a really great faculty member. The younger people don't know he's passed away, but Rutherford Arist was probably one of the most outstanding um, faculty member, also in the classics as well, just a, a Renaissance man. And he was a quiet but very strong believer, and I knew that. It was good to know that he was a believer, and I talked to him, and talked to him about you know, issues I was wrestling with in my faith. And like Dave, about a, a, um, six months later, I decided to follow Jesus as well. And um, slowly, slowly, I started to see grad students are really people. <laughs> and they really, really have issues. Maybe we can talk and we could have work together and, you know, and I could work with them and help them, you know? And I started to have a lot of family. And that was very important, and Kathleen was a lot happier, okay? You know, when you both have the same boss, I think it's a little bit, it's much better in your marriage. And uh, a thing that really helped me with undergrads is when Marin, my second daughter, well, became an undergrad here at the university, and I was counseling her. And it really, you know, those students could be your own child out there, you know, <laughs> finally. And so I think it really helped me to, to empathize more with undergrads and start to spend more time with thinking about teaching. So I'd like to share with you a few tips that I've learned over the 40-some years on teaching 
briefly and then uh, maybe have a few conclusions open up to if there are any questions. But um, I think that overall, teachings like uh, sieving um, polydispersed particles, you know, there's a whole lot of information out there and your professors are trying to sort that out and, and tell you what's most important. We had an exam this morning, and I don't know if we sorted out the most important things. I see some smiling faces in the back there. Uh, I'm helping, st I'm retired, but I'm still helping out, you know, in a class. Um, another thing to recognize is teaching's not a popularity contest, and I welcome some comments from the faculty in the room. And I got a mentor, and I hope I continue to be one. Uh, Dan Frisbee's letting me have an office. I'll be a mentor to faculty as well as students. So feel free to send me an email if you'd like to get together. It can take an infinite amount of time to prepare the perfect lecture. I remember going into Amundsen's office, I said, this job is impossible. You can spend all your time doing research and all your time doing teaching and uh, preparing teaching. So you need to develop that skill. Um, and I see Shang Chang, he's doing good at that, <laughs> balancing that out. Um, and don't try to write a book before tenure. That's a good advice. But I did write one after, and I enjoyed it. Um, get help from people who've taught the course. I write out my lecture notes. I try to, large, because sometimes you're standing in the front, you can't see things. That's, these are practical tips. Go back after each lecture and annotate what worked and what might be better the next time. The hardest course I taught, I know there's a couple mechanical engineers in the room, but it was teaching them material science because there's a certain fraction of mechanical engineers who lack faith in molecules. They don't, <laughs> they do not believe that there are molecules here, you know? If you talk about camshafts and cars, you can really grab a lot of the students, you know? But anyway, that was a difficult course. Um, try to have en enthusiasm in your teaching. I think a passion can rub off and have fun. One year, the Daily wrote that professor, you know, I should have a tie on in the old days. You know, we wore ties and sport coats, and they said, professors just dress really crummy. I don't know what they were thinking about, you know? So I made a, a point to wear uh, something very interesting every Friday. <laughs> Bermuda shorts, a Hawaiian shirt, a tux, you know, just to. Um, another thing is, Enjoy office hours. You know, students' questions, I really, really have appreciated that more in the years. They really um, help you to put yourself in the student situation, the kind of questions that they ask. Uh, and pay attention to comments on course surveys. Uh, we have one coming up next week in the course I've helped teaching. <laughs> Pray for an excellent teaching assistant. <laughs> It's really a gift, and I've been gifted. Uh, one of them is in the room. Tron, good to see you here. Thank you for being a good teaching assistant. Here's something. Actually, I learned from a teaching assistant. When reading reports or listening to presentations, it's always easy to find things wrong. That's our job, is to you know, use the red pen, you know, and mark things up. But you want to find things that are right and encourage students. There's so many times I'll type an email and go back and make the first sentence a positive statement because the person did a whole lot that sent me that, in, you know, that information. And I think it's an important thing in life, not just in, in teaching. So those are some of the things, actually, um, I said some of this in uh, a final lecture in a course last quarter, those, uh, last semester, those points. So this is retirement. Those four kids now are 12 grandchildren and I'm looking forward to visiting them. As I said, I'm still, enjoying being here <clears throat> and traveling with them uh, and really enjoying mentoring grandchildren too. Got a chance to talk to a whole bunch of them this week on the phone. Uh, and we're going to the Philip, Jeff is a Filipino, married to my oldest daughter, and we're gonna go to the Philippines uh, after spring break. Let me conclude. Not just for teaching, but any career. Think about it as a calling. Engineering is a calling, right? Why? Because people need us as engineers for safety in their products, for developing new products that are 
of value, of reasonable cost, and innovative, that can do something that couldn't be done before, hopefully helping society. But we also know that we have to manage the environment. Yesterday we had the National Science Foundation review of our Center for uh, Sustainable Polymers, and we have to think of ways to sustain our society with all the plastic that is around. So it definitely can be a calling. We can be serving others. We are serving others in our profession. When you're thinking about where you want to go with your career, you need to be thinking about what God wants you to do with the talents that he's given you. He's created you in his image. And he has a plan for you. Keep asking him about what his plans are. I like to tell students that there are three important decisions in your life. I don't know if you can think of the other two. We've been talking about that. Think a minute. What are, there's really just three key decisions that you need to make in life. And the career is what we've been talking about. And the calling, right, to what you're intended to. But the second is, will you have a life partner? And if so, who is that partner? Important decisions. And a lot of you are thinking about that already. And finally, everyone, as Pascal said, has a God-shaped vacuum. If it's not God, you're filling it with something else. And our society gives you a whole bunch of things to fill it with. Your passions of you know, food and exercise and you know, sports. But what do you really, what's really your passion? And really, our calling is first. Whether we know it or recognize it or not, our calling is first to Jesus Christ. That's our calling. And he created us for his purpose. And he created us to work. We're supposed to work, all right? We're not just hanging around here. And it may be that it's engineering for you. But, uh, and this is a great website on the theology of work. Uh, if you're interested and you're concerned about, or even changing jobs, it has some really good things there. But glad to uh, have shared with you a little bit about my career and be glad to uh, share some questions. Moderate, uh, any questions that uh, anyone has? Is this a special? Uh, whatever happened to your business partner at the end when you kind of spoke? That's a really good question. Joe, right? So Joe and I, oh, so whatever happened to Joe, my, my best friend in grad school. I danced with his wife at the, you know, uh, the graduate student parties. He wound up having three daughters. And he did what I asked, said he should do. He quit, I think within a year, General Electric, and he went full-time working for Rheometrics. And it was a great time uh, because there's a lot of neat, you know, it was the only instrument really that could do rheology of polymer melts and cross-linking systems. And so it grew rapidly. And uh, it even got onto the American Stock Exchange. But Joe married the company. He wouldn't come home for dinner a lot of times. And he, he uh, felt guilty. He, he hired me as a consultant. And that was actually, you know, God, I said, God, you know, God's answer to me is, I have a better plan for you, Chris. It was great because I got paid. I don't have to worry about the company. I went in and I got paid. I could buy a pretty good house sooner than I might have been able to. And, um, but Joe, I, I, I stayed at his house, I got to know his family, and he continued with the company. But of course, he had to sell, to, to grow, he had to sell the stock off. And eventually, he did not own 50% of the company. And eventually, the investors weren't too happy. And, and, and he even started talking to competitors. And finally, they said, first they demoted him from president, finally said, Joe, you're out. But the saddest day was when um, his middle daughter, Karen, got married 
at the Princeton uh, Chapel, which is just really beautiful. And so Kathleen and I went back to the wedding. Oh, I should have said, <laughs> for I missed one thing, when the company said goodbye to Joe, his wife said goodbye. The same week. So, and um, he, he got another job and he was working. But anyway, the daughter got married maybe a couple, a couple years after that. And the divorced parents were there. And, uh, you know, it was a beautiful wedding. But think about it. If you have a brother or sister, his, her two sisters did not come to her wedding. Think about that. How fractured that family was. It was just horrible. Uh, and I just could feel that. So um, the company was sold for $26 million. And Joe got some of it, but he had to split it with his wife. And um, he had a brain tumor. And uh, I went to see him. He was living in Ohio then. And he said, Chris, you were right about God. And he actually did um, become a believer. He had two brothers who were really uh, strong believers, and eventually he did. So I was glad at, before he died, and he has passed away now. But that was uh, what happened. To, and uh, rheometrics then became part of TA Instruments. And uh, some of you who do rheology tests in the lab will see that up there. So that, thanks. Long answer to a short question, sorry. But it was interesting follow-up on God had a better plan. You know, then I wasn't flying back to New Jersey all the time, and, and it, I was decoupled from the business decisions. Um, so it was really, really, really good. And then God also had a plan that I would become a better teacher, right? <laughs> Through that. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that preparing for teaching uh, took up a lot of the time. So how do you balance the demand of teaching and research and family life balance? Yeah. I think maybe you need to talk to somebody else because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> if my wife were here, she would tell you that even now, you know. But you do need to. And in fact, Trong and I were talking last night about, you know, he's interested in, in teaching, but he's worried about just your question. And I think everybody does. Um, you got to, I think, you try to separate, and I was never very good at that, so that's where I failed. But to try to say, okay, I'm going to stop at a certain. Now, one thing I did is I took the bus home every night, so that would get me home because the last bus left at about you know quarter to six, so I'd be home, and I always had dinner with my kids, and I helped put them to bed, and then I go back to work until you know one or two o'clock getting the lectures ready. So uh, you know, once you have your lecture set, it's a little bit easier. But those first couple of years are not. Not easy. We try to bring in faculty here and give them the first year. Uh, in fact, uh, Nathan was talking to me this week that, you know, that first year you don't have a full load of teaching. And so you should take a job, you know, if especially at a research university where you can get your research started. But very good question. Yeah. Um. Do you have any thoughts about the uniqueness of teaching as a professor versus being an engineer in industry or? Um, the difference between being an engineer and being a professor or? As a calling. As a calling, right. And I think you have to ask God about that, you know. I, I wasn't even thinking about a calling. I just was doing what me wanted to do, you know, because it was so exciting to do research and things like that. But I think God used it. And God uses the situations even that you get into that maybe wasn't the first thing. But that website is pretty good to help you think these through, if, especially if you're a believer, you know. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I probably could have been, uh, you know, I don't know, you know. But that's where I am, and I'm glad, to, glad, I, I'm glad I chose it, you yeah. know. Or he chose it for me. Yes. Uh, Chris, uh, I think you may probably know Hal Miller. Hal Miller, yes. Anyway, Hal Miller, at least I know the retired person. Um, we used to talk all the time about how hard it is to be a visible Christian here at the U. Would you say something about that? That's a, that's a real good question. I think, in a way, maybe the society a little bit more open today. I think you shouldn't be afraid. I try in my classes to let students know that I'm a Christian. Uh, but. I mean, that's not the subject I'm teaching, so I just mention it typically at the beginning. And some of the other faculty have also thought that. 
uh, and try to do that. And, uh, um, and then be available to students, you know? And I don't know. What, uh, David, what do you think about professors identifying themselves in a class? Yeah, you, David. <laughs> I mean, I'm picking a senior that I know and won't be afraid to say. <laughs> You're the only professor I know who's done it. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think somebody said they never, yeah, somebody, a friend of mine said, even though there were many professors, he went to uh, University of Texas, and there are, I know a lot of, he said he didn't know anybody that was a Christian. So I think maybe it's a good thing to, but thanks for that question, and we should encourage the professors in this room to gently, but you know, it's, your grade does not depend, you know, I gotta make that just, but you're allowed, you're, you're totally, you know, who am I? And uh, uh, just to let, let you know, you know, I, I try to do that. Yeah, I'll ask one last question for you, Krista. Like, what's your vocation now? What's your... <laughs> what's my... It's my son asked me that. Well, you know, being a good grandfather, but a mentor, you know, what did we say? Find a good mentor and be a good mentor, right? I think that's important. And uh, I still enjoy our interactions uh, on Tuesday morning, and as many times I can be here, I'll do that. And I encourage you as students to come see me. Um, uh, and, and, you know, just to arrange regular times to get together. But I do want to rewrite my rheology book. <laughs> so that's, that's another goal I have. Um, yes? Yeah, your Lectio Divina class, is that open to both faculty and students also? Well, we've got senior grad students, but, you know, and it's, it's good to break it into smaller groups, too. So uh, I encourage other people. To, it's very simple. You just read a section of scripture and meditate on it. Um, be glad to tell you more about it, but it's, it's a, uh, no, no preparation. It's just more sharing uh, what the Holy Spirit is bringing to you. Yeah. Yes? How does your faith inform your view of science, creation, the mystery that you uncovered? Yeah, that was actually in the beginning a little bit hard because I was quite a materialist. And, you know, the whole world just happened and, you know, that was okay. But I started digging in on it and actually... I think for me, the origin of the first cell is a critical uh, step that there is no idea. In fact, there's really good arguments that it couldn't happen spontaneously. There's absolutely nothing we know. And because I know enough chemistry to at least dig into that a little bit. And so that was a, that was a good point in my, after I, you know, I think it's, you know, to, to follow God, um, it's not just an intellectual thing, you know, this, there's a, a spiritual, emotional, you know, uh, connection that I felt, and I hope others have felt, and you can, people should share that with each other. But you also have some intellectual things, and one of them was the, you know, that this materialist worldview uh, had to be better understood, uh, and God is the creator. And it's quite clear to me, as a scientist, you know what I find? is physicists are more open than biologists. It's interesting. I don't know in the audience here. Expanding minds. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Physicists are, and my son, who did uh, really kind of uh, cellular biology, went to biophysics and it was easier. He was a strong believer and had some challenges in finding a faculty job. And, uh, but hopefully the world will change, right? And people will recognize that the creator is behind all of our science. Somebody, when Eris retired, the, um, it was a classics professor, uh, or a etymology, what was it Lieb Lieber what's a Lieberman, isn't it? Anton? Entomology, yeah, An Anatoly Lieberman. Yeah, Anatoly Lieberman. He said, Eris was a strong believer and he knew that. He said, um, God created certain phenomena and then he pulled the scaffold away. And Eris is trying to figure out, and all of us who do research, the part of that scaffold, how it, how it works, how it functions. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Great, well, I've, maybe I'll just take a moment to thank uh, Ties and Crew and Anselm House for hosting this great event. And uh, let's just uh, give up our applause to Chris here and then uh, the, the witness he's been in this community for so many years now. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, I have some quick announcements for upcoming events. Um, so on Tuesday, Erica Kidd from the University of St. Thomas is going to be leading a discussion um, to introduce St. Augustine's classic book, um, Confessions. So that's happening um, Kaufman at noon on Tuesday, if you're interested. Also on Tuesday, Erica Kidd is giving um, a lecture about Augustine and grief at Ansem House. Um, that's at 7 p.m. Um, on Wednesday of next week, uh, Dr. John Tilbert and Carl Elliott are going to give a lecture on health care as a moral formation. Um, lunch is provided for that event. Um, if you're interested in any of those events, uh, talk to Anselm House staff. They'll be in the back of the room. Um, and then next Thursday night, TIES, the student group that I'm a part of, um, we are going to start reading uh, C.S. Lewis's <coughs> book, Miracles, and we'll be reading that throughout the semester. Um, so if you're interested in that or want to uh, um, see what TIES is all about, you can talk to me or Luke Troxel right over there. So again, I'd like to thank you guys for coming to this event. Thank you, Dr. McCosco. It was a great time. I hope you guys all have a good rest of the day.